1981. And there wasn't really much information out there at that time, was there? There were maybe three books. That was, of course, there was no internet, you understand. Mm -hmm. We didn't have internet. Um, and uh, Gopi Krishna wrote what is kind of the foundational work that everybody reads. And then there were a couple of other books, those being uh, what is called The Serpent Power. And it was written by an Englishman in India who translated an ancient text. And the other one was a book by, and I believe he was an optometrist, but he got interested in Kundalini. And he wrote a book about people that he knew who had had Kundalini. And that were, those were our examples. So but, here's a question for you. you I'd like you in a moment to go into the actual first experience you had, but you didn't know that's what it was. How did you yes, learn? I did. Yes, I did. Well, you did. Okay. Oh, I did. <laughs> but I didn't know what it was going to be. Yeah. So tell us about that first experience that you had. Well, okay. I'll tell you. First of all, like many people who experience Kundalini, I was going through a kind of personal trauma. And that trauma was that I had been in a very stable, very close, long-term relationship, which was now falling apart right in front of my eyes. Because my partner said she wanted to get involved with the colleague. And I said, sure, go ahead. But it was devastating for me because mm -hmm. I trusted this person. I had, you know, had not challenged the relationship. And so the whole world was just kind of going like this, you know, as it does when you have a shock of some kind. Can be anything. Most of us have been there, I think. When the bottom falls out of the floor and mm -hmm. you feel like, You've had it. So there I was in that state, and I just happened to be reading a book which mentioned Kundalini. It didn't tell you, it was only two pages. It didn't say much about it. The whole book was not about Kundalini. The book was about world mythology. But he mentioned this. And then there, in that moment, it occurred to me, I wondered if I could do this. I wonder if I could bring those energies up. You're not supposed to be able to do that. As you probably know, in India, particularly in ancient times, maybe now too, so anyone who wanted to become a Kundalini master had to spend years preparing. The idea was you had to purify your body, purify the channels so that the energies, when they came, could get through, could flow. So they would spend literally years. Some went into caves and ate grass, from what I read. <laughs> they really were serious. And, uh, uh, but they prepared and they, and the main thing was you had to have a guru, a teacher, because otherwise you wouldn't know what you were doing. Mm -hmm. Well, I was one of those who didn't know what I was doing, but I was doing it anyway. <laughs> so, so I didn't know much about Kundalini, but I did know that it was starts at the, uh, in the base, in the bottom. And then the energies theoretically would move up, presumably through the spine and the chakras. And then finally, after years of striving and purification, finally, it would reach the crown. And then the crown itself would open. And it would be, they described it as being like a lotus petal, a lotus leaf, flower which would open unfold 
petal by petal, and they call that enlightenment. Well, I knew those words, but I didn't know what they were really talking about. <coughs> so, I decided to try my experiment. So how did I do that? Well, okay, I had seen or heard or read or something about a Tai Chi master or, uh, who uh, would have his students develop what he called their ball. And it was a ball of energy that came out from the lower abdomen. And uh, that's what he called it, your ball. And it was warm and it was energetic. And I thought, well, maybe I'll start with that. So I tried to see if I could have a ball. Well, I could. Before I knew it, the ball, I felt that ball. I thought, well, so far, so good. Now, how do I get that ball up? I thought, well, all right. I'll concentrate and I will focus just on that and I'll breathe as deep as I can. I called it yogi breathing. I don't know if it was or not, <laughs> but, but I thought of it as I was going to be a yogi and I was going to do this yogi breathing. So inhale, very deep. Up, 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 up. What about the third time that I said up, that ball of energy shot and I mean shot into my head, even before I, I hardly knew what was happening. But it came into my head. And the energy, the ball of energy was ecstatic. It felt ecstatic. And now my head felt ecstatic inside. That was new. And then it was like, and I will describe this in two ways. It really was like a flower unfolding. It was pulsating. My head was pulsating, pulsate, pul pul. And every single pulsation was ecstatic. So that happened. I said I'd do two, didn't I? <laughs> well, anyway, <laughs> whatever the other one was. But it was incredible. And I knew it was Kundalini. What else could it be? I had asked for it. I had tried to bring it up. Uh, it was doing what the book said. You know, it was moving from the lower to the upper parts of the self, of the, of the being, of the body. So my head opened. And at one point, it seemed like I felt the energies from the universe come in and flow into my head. And that was something because you talk about union, you really feel your union when that happens. And I did that for a while. And then it occurred to me, I really don't know what I'm doing. Should I continue doing this? I don't think so. I think I better get this down and figure out more what it is I'm supposed to be doing. And so I did bring it down. So how long did this whole period last? Was this you know, that's a real good question. I think maybe that when it got into my head and I was feeling, you know, and you're just focused on that. You're not aware of anything in your surroundings or any, any uh, disturbance. I don't know, the answer is I don't know after all that. I think maybe it could have been six or seven minutes. I mm -hmm. could be wrong because you don't have a good sense of time when you're in that situation. So it does sound as if your, your thinking capacity, your intellect was still there. It was like, still there. Yeah. I had occasionally, well, that was just the beginning, you see. That was just the beginning. One day of many days. I did not know that was going to happen. 
I thought, well, perhaps this is a one-time thing. You do this and then you do maybe something else. The energy, the ecstasy, as I will call it, and I call it that because somebody else, I knew one person who had heard of Kundalini. One. I, she had been with Osho up in his, uh, she was in India and then again in Wichita. And she's the one, I didn't even have a name or word for what was happening to me in my head. And she's the one, she said, you have experienced ecstasy. And I said, is that what it is? I didn't know. So, um, so I had that word and the ecstasy came back the next day and the next day and the next day and it was summer, thank goodness. And I wasn't teaching. I just had to go it on my own. And you initiated each of these, right? They didn't just spontaneously arise. Well, I initiated it, but the point is, you're not supposed to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do it now, I don't think. I just couldn't. Most people couldn't. Um, I did, yes, I initiated it. But in effect, it was spontaneous because who was I to say I can do this? You know, I, I don't know. Uh, there's a lot of questions around my experience, I'll never, it's always a mystery, I'll never have an answer. Mm -hmm. Well, okay, I'm not teaching, I'm home alone all day. I experience these floods of ecstasy, on and on and on, and it is very intense. I say, have said it was like having a big brass band appear and then march around in your living room. It was huge. And so finally, one day I just lay on the floor like this. And I just said, here I am, God, take me for whatever you want to do with me. What else could you do? And that was the first summer. <laughs> but it didn't stop. Now, I got into some problems when fall came and I had to uh, go back to teaching and I had to be more focused and I couldn't focus too well. I was, my head was still kind of going like this as long as I could stay in my living room and do whatever, whatever, I was just fine. If I had to go to work, I had to go teach. I had to be in front of students and answer to them. That was a different thing. It was difficult. And then at the same time, right then, my mother became ill about, she was about two and a half hours away. And uh, I was worried about her. I had to go down every once in a while and see if try to help with her. And I was not feeling so good because uh, there were, too, you know, too many demands, too much stress. And that was my first experience of the negative aspect of Kundalini. So at this point, did that, you, what prompted this, of course, was that very difficult end of a relationship. Oh, did, yeah. Did you find that this, these Kundalini experiences you were having um, helped you deal with that relationship change? Um, or was that still just something that had, was causing the same pain that anybody who had lost somebody, a relationship would experience? Well, I think it was the latter because mm -hmm. it was devastating. Yeah. So yeah. the Kundalini experiences, even though it, it started, started with this change in a valued relationship, the experience itself didn't seem to come back and uh, ease that pain at all. Well, except that I got a new lover. <laughs> and the lover's name was Kundalini. Yeah, that's and, interesting. You know, I believe it's the Sufis that think of their deity sometimes as their lover. 
Mm -hmm. There's a lot of love poetry in the Sufi literature. And um, it's what I'm going to say now is going to startle you, but it's true. It is like having a lover because the Kundalini makes love to you from inside. How could that be? I don't know. But it, it does. It's, it's like it's making love to you inside. There's never any touching. I would add that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's like having a lover right there present with you. Mm -hmm. It's amazing. Does it feel like it's a personality? Well, it's got some personality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's like, as I said, it's like your lover that's found you, and here I am, I'm your lover. Uh, it's, it's a very feeling experience. Mm -hmm. And so I never it, had paid much attention to bodily sensation of that kind before. And I was surprised to discover there's a whole world of experience that existed below your neck. <laughs> I was so you learned that you had an ability to bring this kundalini energy you, uh, from your lower chakra region, I guess, up through your, into your head to open you up. Mm -hmm. uh, and you went through a summer of these experiences. It's, it must have been one heck of a summer. Uh, mm -hmm. Then you tried to get settled back into teaching. Did you have to... Uh, how did you manage that? Did you have to put your kundalini kind of aside to get re-grounded to be able to teach? Or were you able to, to find a balance somehow between um, having this new lover, if you will, and, and the responsibilities for teaching? That's quite a question. Um, well, it's hard to say because I had so much going at once, you know, I had to breakup of the relationship. I had uh, the Kundalini awakening. I had um, um, my mother ill. I was handling quite a, quite yeah. a lot. Mm -hmm. And I don't think, I think I kind of faded out of the ecstasy experience for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, because I couldn't focus on that, um, then it was it was a rough winter. It was, winter was harder than the summer. So here you are, a woman with high intellect. You have a PhD, yeah, uh, and you're teaching in a university setting. Yes. Um, so you've had this experience that you you initially didn't know much about. You had a little exposure to it. Did that kick off a, a curiosity on your part to learn what this was all about? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's been the focus of my life since that time, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say I read everything I could find. I, did a, I, I didn't have anyone to talk to. When I say no one to talk to, I mean literally i didn't have a when you have a big experience in your life generally you want to tell somebody your best yeah. friend or somebody that, that this this happened to me i'm not the same i didn't have anybody like that i didn't have for for almost 15 years i had almost no one to share with and i did uh keep a journal because I, I don't know, something told me that this was important because of how, early, how when it was at a time when nobody knew anything about this, it was practically a secret society. And um, so I kept a journal and eventually I put that journal together as a book and it is oh. most published. What was the name of your first book? The, that book was called Unmasking the Rose because mm -hmm. the rose is the archetypal symbol of mystery, magic, all of that, the rose. 
And so unmasking to me meant going into it, finding out what it really represented. And I think it does represent Kundalini. Mm-hmm. For me, it does. Because I think, well, you, go ahead. You had uh, at least a, a mother who was not in good health. Did you find that you did try to reach out to some people and, and just because you didn't even make that effort to? No, and later, after several months and after I'd kept this journal, I did try to show it to a couple of close friends, but they didn't get it. They had no idea what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, somebody said, and I think it's true, you cannot understand Kundalini unless you've had it. Mm -hmm. It's got to be in your body and it affects every single person differently. Everybody has a different set of symptoms. Now there's a list of of, uh, symptoms of Kundalini not everybody has all the symptoms. You know, it's a, a spectrum. And people, different people have different combinations. But um, that was my combination, ecstasy. <laughs> now, you've, you've written some poetry as well. Oh, yeah. And uh, my understanding is that your poetry is, uh, is a great attempt at trying to communicate uh, some information on this subject. Can you, do you have a poem there that you might read to us? Well, uh, yes, I have this book, which is the newest book. And it's called The Goddess Speaks. And it's poems of ecstasy and transfiguration. Now you might be self-conscious about writing an ecstasy poem. They write them a lot in the Middle East because you are talking to your spirit guide, your soul guide, whatever, as if that being, that creature, whatever it is, were a lover. So, and that's the way it makes you feel. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I have uh, this book, um, And I'll read you a couple of poems. This is called The Cave of Secrets. There are many passageways into the cave of secrets. Some find the opening by howling and flailing about, hoping for an answer. Some discover it in quietude, silence, and prayer. Gentle light descending. Earnest pilgrims wake up one day and find they are already there. Already know the secrets. Hold them in their hearts. Whisper them to others in familiar syllables, unknown tongues. This is called Poets' Faces. I look at the poets faces, and they are beautiful and wry. They know things and have to say them and how to say them. They have been there as witness to small events and consequential happenings and taken notes I am still struggling to mold a decent countenance. Each year, texture more amorphous, outlines more uncertain, as if 
I did not belong here, as if it all was a mistake. And I got delivered to the wrong planet and never found my intended home. Still, I feel connected to something not definable, something not seen, but felt a feather brushing my ear, a soft breeze stroking my belly. Even now, almost no one knows me. But I'm not concerned. I am hidden and diligent. Word gets whispered into my ear and I say them and sometimes people listen. I love the way you read. Oh, thank you. I mean, it, it's a, a pace that allows, I hope other to have the same experience, but it allows me to absorb what you're saying. Um, yeah, um, you have to have time. Do you have another one there that you... Yeah, well, if you want to hear this other one, I'll read it. Yeah, we'll take a third one, then we'll get back into our conversation. Yeah, okay. Well, this is called The Follower of Melchizedek. And Melchizedek is a word that you find in the Bible. It's not the name of a person, at least that's what I have read. It's a, it's a, a group, a tribe, uh, a group of people. And there's a quote in Hebrew, which relates to Melchizedek. Call to be a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And I looked it up and I found out that Melchizedek, the order of Melchizedek, these are like priests, but they're not in robes. They don't have a church or a sanctuary. They operate like a priest, but they're, they're kind of hidden, kind of hidden. I have no robe, nor even a mark on my forehead. I have never worn resplendent clothes and sat on a throne in front of many adoring followers, all waiting to be instructed as to how to live their lives. I cannot levitate nor transfer myself to other places by desire or teleportation. I have never even gone out of my body or almost died and returned. Yet I have had experiences of making love with my invisible to tender to be told. I have listened to those who craved some sympathetic being to hear their stories and help them on their path. I have been informed with sacred truths by unknown sources that have guided me to receive reflections and to unexpected knowings. I have received visions and revelations, danced to different music, swum in a different sea. I was the outsider, always alone in my journey, always striving to fulfill my mission. I never spoke of my ecstasy or my pain. Who was there to hear? Thank you. Um, I'm wondering, uh, the, you brought these experiences on. You had the intensity of that first summer. Did you continue pursuing this over the subsequent years? 
You, you had a new well, lover. It pursued me. <laughs> I can't make this happen. It, it finds me. It comes and it's often a surprise. Mm -hmm. It's like a lover that kind of hides and jumps out at you when you walk uh -huh. in the room. <laughs> no, I don't. I, don't I, I, I allow time for it to happen. I have the time for it to happen. And uh, in the summer, preferable. When the summer came, I went next summer, I went back into this ecstasy daily. Uh, I got off the path at one point for me getting off the path. Excuse me, but did you know that the names are not correct in front of these two pictures? Uh, I don't know if people get confused or not, but uh, this says Leslie Rice, this says Daniel Andy. They're, they are panelists as well, but they are not showing their video. Leslie will come in when we get oh, into the okay. Q&A period and Daniel. Oh, I just didn't want to think I was Daniel or S. Leslie. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. okay, I was just confused. Well, anyway, I want to tell you how I got off the path. I was, ha okay, I was doing what I considered meditation. For me, meditation consisted of imaging, a, a mental image of imaging an image of uh, Shiva, Shiva Shakti, half man, half woman. Uh, I would just bring that image up and I would go into in flow of flow into this ecstasy. And a woman that I knew was a teacher of transcendental meditation. Now, many people have had wonderful experiences with transcendental meditation. And she said, you don't know what you're doing. You should let somebody who knows something about it teach you what to do. Here, here's your mantra. There was a mantra. Mm -hmm. I hated that word. I just hated it. it was a word. I had promised her I would do this for six months, I guess, to give it a fair try. And I started doing that. And I didn't feel any ecstasy and I didn't feel any energy flowing through my body. That wasn't the purpose of this mantra. Um, and then I started having headaches. And then I started having migraine headaches. And it was now several months, a few months after I had uh, started. And I said, enough. Oh, and then I had, then my doctor said, you have to go have a brain scan because people your age don't start having migraine headaches out of the blue unless they've got a brain tumor. I knew I didn't have a brain tumor, but I said, all right. So I did. I had a brain, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? MRI, I guess you call it, something like that. Anyway, yeah. I went into that tube. Right. Yep. And and uh, guess what? I didn't have a brain tumor. <laughs> and I said, I can't do this anymore. I don't care if I did promise. This is too much to ask of it. Why would I give up something I love for something I hate? <laughs> that was just me. Yeah. That was just me, you know. Uh, so I quit that. And I went back, I thought, to my original practice. Well, you can't step in the same river twice. I wasn't where I had been before. I could try, but I simply wasn't at the same place. I didn't have the same level of energy, you know, and excitement and everything. But I thought, well, what else can I do? So I started back trying to get back where I was and eventually I pretty much did but it took a while to get back into the routine so um and then I met Andrew Harvey now I don't know if you all know who Andrew Harvey is no tell us who he is well actually he is a world-renowned spiritual teacher and uh, he, has, he is brilliant, everybody agrees. Andrew is brilliant. He has studied every 
lineage there is. And he's much adored by his followers. And we became friends. And uh, he was teaching in San Francisco and I was auditing his classes. And so uh, he said, he, I actually, see, I had tried to tell two people my story, people that should have known better. And one was, a, I guess you'd say, an energy teacher. He was teaching us how to walk slow, you know, and concentrate. And I told him, I thought he'll understand what I'm talking about. He said, if you're lucky, you'll get over this. He said that with a, say, a straight face. Well, <laughs> did I want to get over this? I don't think so. You want to get over ecstasy? <laughs> Uh, and then a woman came to San Francisco and she was a teacher of um, Tai Chi. I guess maybe it was Chi Gun, maybe it's Chi Gun, that's it. And she was married to a master Chi Gun teacher from China. He could stand on eggs, you know, that weren't cooked and not break the shell. And he could. I don't know, do stuff like that. He was very advanced. So I asked her and I said, I told her and she looked at me and she looked very puzzled. And she said, well, no, the books just, they only talk about your energy can be heat like hot or cold or else like electricity, nothing like you described. Well, there I was again, stuck out in left field, <laughs> all by myself, no one to talk to. So then um, I met Andrew. I went into his office one day. He was a very formidable guy, or at least he was very, uh, I thought very, well, he didn't mean to be intimidated. He actually was very soft and sweet, but you know, his station in life, he was so famous, he was the luminary. And I was quite in awe of him, but I did tell him. And of course, Andrew was born in India and he's part, as I understand it, he has some Indian blood, but he also has English blood. Well, he didn't bat an eye. He just listened and said, yes, yes, yes. And then I showed him some poems that um, I had written. Sh handshaking <laughs> as I handed it to him. And he said he kind of groaned when I handed it to him because every teacher, I don't care what they're teaching, their students will bring them poems. And some of those poems aren't too good, frankly. And you try to rack your brain for something nice to say. And I could just see Andrew thinking, oh Lord, now what? <laughs> well, they were better than he expected. He liked them. And he said, you've got to write a book of poems. I said, oh, Andrew, I couldn't possibly write a book. I can write a poem now and again, but I couldn't possibly write it. Yes, you could, he said. You could write a book. So I did write a book. And it was called, uh, wasn't Unmasking the, uh, uh, it was called Unmasking, wait a minute, Unmasking the Rose. And then uh, I can't even think of the name of my first book. It was up there a while ago, I think. Um, wait a minute, where is it? Check the uh, screen uh, Daniel's put up uh, your books there. Yeah, except it's not up there. Well, that's all right, because it's an old unmasking, unmasking the rose. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, I mixed up myself, but there is another book and it is called Unmasking the Rose. This one is called The Goddess Speaks. And these are all, no, this is not a, all but one is, is anyway. Oh, look, uh, and uh, so, um, where were we? Uh, so you were talking about uh, Andrew and uh... Andrew. 
and Andrew really like he read Unmasking the Rose. Uh, the uh, he read it when it was still in manuscript, and he came over to my kitchen one morning, and he sat down. He kept saying, "Cut it, cut it, cut it." Well, it was awfully hard to cut your own words. <laughs> you know, you want to hang on to the New Year's. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he showed me and he just went through and he went <laughs> and every time I saw exactly right perfect that's what needs to come out so he helped me with that first book and um, it was published and many people have said that it's helped them through their awakening experience because Although what they say is, this is not my experience, but it's enough like minds that it inspires me. It helps me to know that there's some other person who went through something and it's like what I've been going through. So I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, do you see um, an increasing frequency of Kundalini experiences? Are, um, are we awakening to something? Uh, you were all by yourself, not much information when you first got uh, started in this. If you look at the, the tra trajectory, are more people, I, I noticed a couple messages that at least one person today has said that, that, that she had a, an experience. Is, there, is this an increasingly, um, I shouldn't call it a common phenomenon, but at least increasing in frequency relative to maybe 15 years ago? Well, I think so. Now, I don't, of course, we've got communications now that we did not have then. Mm -hmm. And people know about Kundalini, and even if they haven't had it, they know, at least have heard about it. Um, I think, of course, I think that's all tied in with the, pers with the perspective which I have that we are undergoing spiritual awakening worldwide. I think two things are happening at once. I think the external world is collapsing. And sometimes it, we wonder if we can ever re recover. But the same, it's like the yin yang. You've got the one, which is the dominant culture, but on the other side, you've got a little spot and that's the beginning of the new age, which is there ready to spring forth and it's growing and it's growing. And everybody says that, you know that. <laughs> oh yeah. I imagine most of the people that are attending tonight are more aware of, of this concept than the average population. I'm there. sure that's true. And, uh, uh, isn't it wonderful? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you got to start somewhere. But to me, it's remarkable what's happening. Maybe it's because I, like you, come in contact with that kind of person, that kind of, as one of my friends said, this is the only gay men in town. <laughs> and in a way it is, it's to me the most exciting thing. It's the most uh flowering thing. I think it's happening. I think we're in it. I think it's happening. I think that it's not going to go away. But nobody has a, has a guarantee how the story is going to turn out. Well, I think they're going to, there are challenging aspects to it as well. I, oh, yeah. You know, I, I talked to my mother, and I don't want to get into politics here, but uh, um, there's yeah, kind of a... <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of this feeling like, gee, ain't it awful? Uh, and I look at it and I say, every time, at least in my lifetime, I've gone through difficulties, it's led to something better. Yeah. So I think that happens. Somebody once said in one of our, another meeting a week or two ago, um, he, when he experiences difficulties, he asks, what am I to learn from this? Well, that's what he's to learn, what he's to learn. So you have this, you know, Kundalini is something that's teaching us something. You know, your voice, I think uh, the things you're saying 
are are lending uh, uh, building awareness of of what's going on. I hope so. Yeah. I really hope. But of course, I'm just thankful to find like-minded people mm -hmm. because I didn't have anybody at all for years and years and years. Just a little bit here and a little bit there. And maybe somebody was going through town and you'd meet them for 10 minutes. And that was about it. Yep. There's well, I want to open up. Uh, you know, yeah. I would love to ask you questions uh, just between you and me, but uh, I don't want to dominate your time here. Uh, Leslie um, has just joined us uh, visually. And oh. I'm going to let her pick some of the questions that have been posed and maybe some of the comments and let you uh, uh, expound on them. Well, you too. We can both expound. So Dorothy, thank you so very much. This has really been very um, interesting. And we have several questions from our audience. So I'm going to start out with, can spiritual experiences be manufactured? And if so, from your perspective, is that a good or a bad thing? I don't know what they mean by manufactured. I have no uh, idea what they mean. They're going to have to explain it. Is that a they fake? Maybe uh, they need it initiated uh, as opposed to arising on their own. Can you, um, can you seek to create experiences? You know, people who have near-death experiences can't create them. No. But uh, you've, you indicated uh, you actually created your Kundalini experience. Well, you say that, but I don't know anybody else who could duplicate that, and I couldn't duplicate it. Oh. It was a kind of combination of circumstances that happened, unforeseen, which prepared me. And in that moment, I thought, I, I'm going to see if I can do this. But uh, <coughs> I shouldn't have been able to do it. How about this concept? Uh, we, we tend to think of ourselves, you know, we come into this life and, and we don't have an appreciation of guides and, you know, we may get involved in religion and we believe there's a God. Uh, but maybe these experiences, uh, maybe there's something going on behind the scenes that we have. Um, each of us has a different path to walk. And some people's paths, like yours, is not unique, but certainly different than most of us. But uh, I look at uh, Jose's not with us tonight, but Jose had a near-death experience. Um, you know, the, the path we walk, uh, I said this earlier to somebody, I don't believe, I'm going to use a financial term, it's not a random walk. Um, we go through life and we have things that we are destined to experience um, and it's different for everybody but it's whatever is uh, is important to us in our growth um, at least that that's a, a belief system that I've developed um, you had this experience and maybe part of that was so that you could be a uh, an aid to this awareness this awakening that's going on uh, I hope so that's exactly what I hope. And, and by the way, I do help people going through. And I, I don't take them through the whole process. But I'm happy to hear if somebody needs to tell their story. I am happy to tell them they are not crazy. And that they are having a normal human experience. And in fact, this is the life force itself that is arising within them. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I try to do all I can to yeah. increase awareness. Well, if I may, uh, Sheila asks if you've ever um, meditated before you spontaneously reached Kundalini state, and if you've discussed this experience with a yogi. With a yogi? Yes. I, I know lots of people who are what I would call advanced yogis. I, I don't know that I have what you have in mind. I don't have a little man in a 
<laughs> I think she's referring to a teacher, um, somebody who would be adept at guiding people well, uh, through the raising of Kundalini. Oh, because because look what happened. Look what happened twice when I tried to talk to people who should have known about energy work, at least. So uh, I don't want a yogi. I have, a, I have one. It's inside. Because this is not only my lover, this is my teacher right here. This is what led me through that difficult experience. I think we all have a yogi inside, and that's the best authority we can find, I think. Uh, changing topics, this is a really interesting question uh, that comes from Ron. And he would like to know if there's any research connecting kundalini energy trauma and traumatic brain injury, as well as epilepsy. So in other words, people who ha are having kundalini energy, uh, traumatic brain in injury or epilepsy. And I'm assuming that what he means by this, have people gotten this confused? I'm having a kundalini experience, but it's being diagnosed as something else all the time. Uh, that has been a major issue within the uh, Kundalini research people, with Kundalini researchers. And uh, often people were mistakenly diagnosed as schizophrenia or who knows what. And they put them in institutions because they weren't acting, acting according to the normal patterns of behavior. What they were really doing was going through a spiritual emergence and they were emerging. Yeah, I knew one fellow who was misdiagnosed that way and he became a doctor, became a psychiatrist. He was so upset over what had been done to him that he, he decided he would try to correct some of this. It's terrible. So going back to an earlier comment, uh, John is asking if you would recommend attempting a kundalini awakening through intention and practice, if one has already had a spiritual awakening through another path. That's a real good question. I think that's up to you how you feel about it. I don't know. The kundalini is separate from any religion or set relief or anything like that. So I think you'll take your kundalini with you. I don't care what path, path, because that's your life force. And what kundalini awakening means, I think, is that what has been in the subconscious mind comes up and is suddenly conscious again. Now it's conscious and uh, you're aware of a lot that you were not aware of before. So I think that leads us into our next question. Uh, Ron asks, are you speaking of a paradigm shift of consciousness? And it sounds as if you are. Uh, you're calling it Kundalini. Others may call it or language it in a different way. And uh, that leads me into this question. Um, since Kundalini comes out of an Eastern paradigm, given what you know now, Dorothy, would you might, uh, is there a way to language this experience that would be uh, more accessible to a Western uh, frame, of, uh, frame of thought? That's interesting. I always thought one reason that I had my experience when I did, because the book I had been reading that triggered it was written by a Western teacher. And that made it more accessible, just the fact that this is somebody out of the West who's talking about this. So um, it's much more than a, a different languaging, believe me. It's a full, it's a full body experience. And you your focus is on what you're feeling, not what you're th thinking. You're not developing a, particularly a, a vocabulary though you do as you go along. But for the first time, your body is totally alive in ways that you simply could not have imagined. 
and you just have all kinds of experiences. No, I think it's much more. I think that's a kind of a not quite facing it head on to just say, well, it's a matter of languages. No, it's not languaging it. It's feeling it. It's a feeling sensation and a I wonderful one. I'm sorry, I was gonna say, I think one of the challenges that we have is when we have these very profound experiences, conveying that experience in a way that others might understand. And unless we are artistically inclined, many of us will fall back on language and language seems to fall, uh, can some in my, be my experience can actually create more confusion that, than <laughs> It, it solves as we try to explain or, or connect people to what we've experienced. Well, these experiences, let us say the experience of ecstasy, is one that you cannot fully convey in language. You can't. It's like sitting there with somebody and you're both listening to a piece of music and you're having different sensations. You can't transfer to that other person, what you're feeling inside. But you can try, and if you're a writer, and I am a writer, doesn't keep you from trying. <laughs> I've tried, <laughs> I've been trying ever since the beginning. Uh, you know, that. that leads me into uh, a next question by uh, Hillary, who asks, you mentioned how alienating it can be sometimes. How did you deal with the loneliness? Oh, my, well, I just was lonely. I was just lonely. I wrote in a journal. I was doing a little practice. I was doing things to feel the ecstasy. And at that time, at, particularly at the beginning, I could spend two or three hours and call it my practice. I would just think, but there's something else. And that is, as Kundalini operates in your body, you change. It changes you. That's part of its purpose. It wants to go through you. And if it hits a block, it'll push on that block and it'll make you uncomfortable with the block and you will solve, solve the problem. Well, you know that, I'm sorry, uh, that brings up yet another question from uh, Jacqueline who asked Dr. Marjorie uh, Willicott in, at the University of Oregon has done research recently and found that some near-death experiencers and other mystical experiencers have also had types of Kundalini awakenings. What do you think about this? I, th I think she's right. Uh, um, we know that um, so many people after the near-death experience say they have experienced unconditional love. What does that mean? As far as I'm concerned, it means that every cell and every pore and every everything in your body undergoes transformation into bliss, into, uh, uh, well, I call it ecstasy because I think it goes beyond bliss. Uh, maybe it won't every time. And if I might add, as the years go by, these intense feelings that were like a, a brass band marching in your living room settle down. And they get, for me at least, they got softer and softer and gentler and gentler and subtler and subtler. And finally, uh, they weren't like a brass band at all. They were like a little flute playing in the distance. Beautiful, still beautiful, rapturous. So there are lots of different ways you can feel your energy besides hot, cold, and electricity. So um, Dorothy, you uh, uh, talked a little bit about a list of symptoms that one might experience and uh, Jeanette, First off, wants to extend a uh, happy belated birthday, which I understand was on St. Patrick's Day. So happy birthday and you are 91 years old. Um, her question is, days or weeks before your experience, were you experiencing some physical symptoms like waking up at random hours of the night, sweating a lot, crying? 
also, when you say it felt like your lover, was your experience sexual? Did you have an orgasm? Not sure if this is an appropriate question. That's can right. leave it out if need to. And unfortunately, I've read it. So I guess uh, now it's out there in the world. All right. <laughs> What, what did you say again? I think oh, she, I think Jeanette is wanting to understand what you meant by the term Kundalini was your lover. Could you talk a little bit about okay. that? Well, yeah. it felt like a lover. It was very sensuous. I, I never had an orgasm. I have met not very many, but one or two who did. Because you're when you get into sexual energy and spiritual energy, they come from the same place, but they're very different. And uh, I think myself, this is personal, that the spiritual energy, and I call Kundalini spiritual energy, that I think that it is perhaps sublimated sexual energy, which sublimated simply means changing from one state to another. And when that energy, which is very sensuous, goes through your body, it is what could, you don't need a, a physical lover. You don't want a physical, I didn't. You don't want a physical, you just wanna feel that nice energy. And your movements and your actions and your practice get much subtler. And for me, it's gone from, well, I, it wasn't too much even at the first, but, but when I am practicing and doing it and all, what happens to me is this. And I think this is rather remarkable. Now, if you can see my fingers move, that is enough to send the energies racing or going through the body. And sometimes I've had the experience, which I'm grateful for, I don't know that I could do it now, but just by moving the eyes left and the ecstasy flows down the left side, right? It goes down the right side. That's all. Um, if we could uh, go back and revisit an earlier question and the question was, are, um, we didn't really understand what was meant by manufactured. So ex manufactured experiences, are they real? What was meant by manufactured was drug induced. And I'm assuming uh, we're talking about psilocybin or ayahuasca or any of those. So what Robin is asking is, are experiences that have been produced because a drug has been ingested have as much uh, credibility or uh, validity as that which is expressed or experienced without a psychoactive substance? Well, I've read articles about that and I don't know. I do not use any form of drugs because I probably would go through the ceiling. I mean, you develop, you know, you develop I mean, a, a cup of chai is about all I can manage. I can't even do much coffee. You know, uh, you're, you are so much more sensitive, so much more alive. So I, I, I can't answer that question. I have no idea. I you know, I, oh, I'm so sorry. I was harkening oh, back. Oh, I'm harkening back. Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I... I don't think the drug, personally, I just don't think the drug experience could be as good for you as, as uh, just the pure Kundalini. Why do you need a drug? Uh, I'll throw no, I, a comment, uh, Leslie. Um, you, people might read the book by Michael Pollan called How to Change Your Mind. And he puts forward an understanding of the drug experience that okay. perhaps what it does is it's the brain, our human brain has a tendency to filter out a lot of reality. Right. Only focus on those things that are really important to our day-to-day -day stuff. But there's a lot of stuff going on around us that we don't normally, most people don't perceive. And when you take a drug, there's a theory that it, what it does is it 
it's, it suppresses that brain's uh, control mechanism, allowing you to experience more. It's not just a pure uh, creation of an addled mind. It's the mind is, is opening up to experience something more. Yep, I'm not saying that that's, there's any studies that say that's what's really happening, but I, I wanted to throw that out. It's an interesting book to read, How to Change Your Mind. Yeah, well, I, and I think that uh, what you say is true. And I also wonder, often wonder, we all have different nervous systems. And some people could take certain drugs or different amounts of those drugs and get away. It wouldn't bother them at all. They'd get over it and go to work the next morning. <laughs> and some of us, with very little stimulus, would be knocked out flat. I would be afraid to do it for fear. I would never come back. I think I would just, I don't, I don't know, but it's, I've read articles discussing back and forth the value of seemingly spiritual experiences through drugs or not. I don't know. I don't know. Well, I'm hearkening back to an earlier comment that you made is that uh, it's important that we listen to our internal voice. Oh, yeah. That our internal voice can be our guide. And for some people, that may be uh, an effective way to, to go about it. For other right. people, for example, um, drumming, sonic driving can be very effective. So yeah. I think it depends on the person and, and yeah. what they're ultimately looking for, what their, what their journey is about. But I do have one last question for you. Okay. And can you share with us the title of the, uh, and the author of the book you were reading that triggered your first Kundalini experience? Well, his name was William Thompson, Thompson. And he was at that time rather well known as a futurist writer. And uh, so he's not as well known now, he's kind of going out, but uh, he's very bright. He writes very well, and he's mostly a cultural anthropologist, I think you would say. And I don't know if that book is even in print now, but it's one of the best books I've ever read. <laughs> and what is the name of it? Oh, The Time Falling Bodies Take to Light. There's a pun, obviously, on light. The time falling bodies take to light. The time falling bodies take to light. Take to light. Take to lamb. Take to light. Oh, okay. L I G H T. Okay. All it's right. Fun. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Well, uh, this has been very illuminating. We do not have any other questions. Uh, I've got I, some more things I would like to put uh, on. I will. I have one more, Jim. That, that's okay, my ahead. personal one. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we were talking a little bit uh, uh, a few minutes ago about how it is difficult to convey experiences in words, and I was wondering your your poetry has um, helped you express what you have experienced. I feel it has, and although you can't convey the actual experience to another person, people get something from it. And so it depends on the person. This book of poems, I don't know how to say this without sounding, sounding a little bit egotistical or something, but what I find is people who are well along the spiritual path tend to love these poems. And some people cry when they read these poems. Some people, they don't laugh, but what, what is it they do? They cry or, or else they uh, go into bliss. I've had people say I go into bliss when I read these poems. Others say I cried from first to last. Depends on the person, depends on the reader. What they, what they bring to the to the poetry, mm -hmm. because it, it's sort of like 
when I'm trying to get to know people, sometimes I say to you to read Rumi. And if they say, oh, yes, I love Rumi, then I think, aha, it's a kindred spirit. And if they say, yeah, who is Rumi? I think I may have heard of him. I think you're not going to like this. <laughs> um, Dorothy, I have one quick question from Chris. He wants to know if you're a dream worker. A day, like a daydreamer or a, a night dream, a, it's, it's a dream worker. I, oh, a dream worker. A dream worker. Well, what is a dream worker? Uh, Chris, if you would like to type that, uh, type that, that would be awesome. I'm not entirely sure what he means by that. Or she means that by that. Uh, well, then, uh, Jim, if you'll carry on. Oh, here we go. A person who works with night dreams. Dorothy, have you ever had a lucid dream where you become well, aware? Um, um, I am still not sh quite sure what a lucid dream is. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes I've read it's where you direct the dream. It, it can be. I've had a couple of lucid dreams. I've read some books on the subject. Well, Basically, what? you are in a normal dream state. And then in that state, you become aware that you are in a dream state. So it's yeah, your, I, your I, level of consciousness, like, like what you're experiencing right now in, in talking with, uh, with our group here, this level of awareness comes into the dream state. You realize that you are in a dream state and you can look around and if you have enough presence of mind, you can do some interesting things, but that typically takes some uh, development before people get to that uh, capability. Well, to be honest, mostly I don't remember my dreams. Fairly standard dream pattern then. Yeah, Most generally. people don't remember much about their dreams. No, I don't, except once in a while. Yeah. A very vivid dream mm -hmm. will come forth and I will remember that. And sometimes it's more like a flash or an image, say, of a landscape, and it's gorgeous beyond anything we could imagine here. That I've had, and I love that. Yeah. You know, the magic lake or a magic grassy field or something, the colors are so magnificent. So yeah. I, I want to go back for a moment to the, the drug question. Yeah. It occurs to me that I know we have some near-death experiencers here um, that perhaps one of the things about a near-death experience is you, your brain isn't operating the way it normally would. It might be full, pretty fully shut down. And yeah. that allows your consciousness, not the brain component of consciousness, but your broader uh, awareness to experience a broader reality. You're no yeah. longer addled by the physical imposition of the brain and you you're now able to experience a, a much broader reality and i wonder if there are any near-death experiencers who might either say no jim you're all wet or no it seems to make some sense we'll just have to wait for uh, I, I i don't know if there's a way to elevate someone to be able to talk here it'd be nice it looks like i can if somebody if i don't know if people uh, Jim, Chris, uh, Chris W. is, I, I think, would be interested in this conversation. All right, Chris, I just clicked on allow to talk. Can you hear me? Yeah. There he hey, is. Chris. Sorry, you can't see me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm, can you repeat your question again? Well, we're talking about uh, whether, are you a near-death experiencer? Sort of, through dreams, dream, dream work. Okay. I've so had many dreams of, I've been through a death process and now here I'm back. Okay. So I guess the question I was kind of putting out there was, um, would you agree with the notion that our conscious brain, the brain in um, puts barriers up to perceptions. And when that brain is in, not in a normal conscious state, an awakened, awakened state, is it possible that that allows us then to 
have much broader experiences. I would agree with that. Yeah. I would agree with that. I I definitely, you know, I I recognize you, Dorothy. I'm I'm just resonating with uh, your report. And I'll say that when I drop into deep experience, I access experiences that I cannot access in waking state. Mm -hmm. And there's definitely the life force that's there that is informing me about life beyond my imagination. (laughs) I don't know if that helps or not. All right, I've got Jose uh, is available to talk and then I'll, I'll let John has got his hand raised. Jose, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, so, so Jim, just kind of hit me again with that question you were asking because uh, I kind of uh, got a little you're, thrown off, yeah. You're clearly a near-death experiencer. So I was putting for, kind of building on Michael Pollan's notion that our normal brain uh, filters out the vast majority of things that we could be perceiving. And a, a near-death experiencer gets into a state where that brain isn't operating the way it normally would. And, and perhaps that allows the near-death experiencer to experience a broader reality, that there is a reality around us that normally isn't available to us. But in that near-death state, when the brain is 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 shut down or, or not readily available, that allows your the broader part of your awareness to experience something more. Well, I'll just say this. To understand the near-death experience, you have to realize that you reach a point where your brain is physically dead in medical terms. And the experience that you have is well beyond the capacity of a physical brain or of You know, we're talking about immersing yourself in a a state of pure consciousness and the elevation that takes place uh, is is breathtaking, but the experience uh, is is just ultra dimensional. Uh, You're you're in a a space where I, I have aspects or memories of this place, but where I am in certainly another place. And uh, even though in my experience, I met my father there, there are characteristics of familiarity that we have. So I met my father and I saw trees and birds and things like that that are very familiar. There's also a tremendous sense of grace and expansion that takes place and a sense of knowing. So we don't really need to ask questions. They're really, we kind of have the answer. So, I I do believe you're right. There is a tremendous expansion that takes place. Uh, Our brain, our physical brain is very, very limiting. So if you think of your brain as a a computer, you know, you can only put so much information in that computer before it's unable to process anymore. And and that's what the physical brain is. It's uh, it only has, even though the capacity in many ways is almost limitless the breadth of scope to be able to kind of get a sense of what consciousness really is, is well beyond our physical brain. So when we get into those altered states, yes, we have that expansion and we're able to not only experience, but see and feel uh, almost in a physical sense, even though we're not in a physical body, if that makes any sense. Yeah, so it's not just cognitive thought that that doesn't need the brain. It sounds like there's also sensory experiences. You don't need your five senses. Uh, there's something about your broader consciousness that uh, can experience much more than what this physical body with a brain is capable of experiencing. Exactly. The, the physical brain and, and the five senses that we experience are very, very limited when you have this experience of death and you are immersed in this other space where your senses are superhuman. And that process begins as you're dying. 
So I had that moment where I could hear the drop and the IV sound like rain falling on a tin roof. And, and I could see the grain in the, in the wallpaper that was quite distant. So that metamorphosis begins to take place as you're moving through these dimensions or worlds or as we're moving towards heaven, however we want to perceive that. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, that, that awareness is definitely expanded to an unimaginable capacity. Uh, John's got his hand raised. John, let me let you uh, ask your question. Let's see. Yeah. I think you have to unmute. John, you still there? All right, I'm going to allow Ron, there's another one who would like to pose a question. Let me give Ron a chance to uh, uh, pose his question. Go ahead, Ron. Um, I want to know if my mic is working first. We hear it. Yeah. Okay, good. That's the first time. Uh, I just really, really appreciate uh, what you have shared tonight because I'm shaking my head so many times about the unexplainable. And my question is that the consciousness that's still in our brain is the one that when we have a near-death experience is what really what our consciousness is. So when you've had your Kundalini experience, it is a consciousness that is in our brain, but beyond our brain. Yeah. Yes. Ron, I might say that's an awesome statement. <laughs> <laughs> that's an old private joke for those of us from Greensboro. Ron is a, a frequent participant in our Consciousness Cafe, and uh, he always has something to say every time we get together about uh, how awesome everybody is. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess, John, you took your hand down. Maybe you don't have a question you want to uh, pose. Um, well, this, is, this has been an interesting evening. I guess we, uh, I don't know that we have more questions. We could probably talk, you and I could talk for a while, Dorothy, but uh, do you have any um, closing comments you'd like to make to everybody that's, that's still here? You're talking to me now? Yes, yes. Okay. Well, I feel like a friend of mine once at a, at a, years ago at a Kundalini conference and uh, I just met her and she said, oh, just think, we're going to get to talk about Kundalini for the whole weekend. <laughs> I always <laughing>. laugh <laughs> And that's kind of the way I feel. I think it's amazing. Uh, you see, I was... Let me just say this one thing. I was, in effect, given to know at the very first. Somehow I was, I got a download or something. And it said, you are going to be very lonely for your first period here. And then you will meet a few people who maybe have had Kundalini or know something about it. But then everything is going to pick up exponentially and it's going to go faster and faster. Well, I feel that's, that's where we are now. I feel like the whole thing is just, I mean, in my lifetime or my experience, I've gone from nothing, nobody who knew anything about this to, as I've said, Kundalini has almost become a buzzword with certain, some people. And the result is sometimes when they use that word, they're using it at a different level. They're not using it at the full force, uh, authentic level to describe it's real profound. It's, pro it's the most profound experience I can think of. Of course, near death would be one, but it's a near death experience. The old self simply dies. Dorothy, and, I... I'm so sorry. I have a couple more questions for you. Oh, okay. Uh, we uh, purple uh, purple Re Revan uh, would like to know if you were raised in any type of religion. Well, sort of, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, 
my mother uh, was a Methodist from her childhood, but she never was oppress pro oppressive and she never forced anything upon me. She did read the Bible, but she never said the Bible says, you know, that sort of thing at all. She just had her own little private uh, worship. And uh, so uh, my father said he was an atheist, but I'm not sure he, I don't, I excuse him because, um, well, as my mother said, in those little country churches, you know, the little, the little preachers who were there, he just kind of looked at that and said, well, that's not for me. But it was interesting that before he died, he had a book which was an, a biography of, it was either Gandhi, Gandhi or somebody. Anyway, he wrote in the margin, God is truth. And I thought, well, now that's pretty good for an atheist. In other words, he was searching. He wished there was something and he was looking for it. But it was not overly religious, but it was not overly atheist either. We didn't uh, uh, go on the television and speak against knowing anything about God. Uh, you kind of, they kind of let you alone, I think, I felt. Yeah. And the final question comes from Teresa. And she would like to know if you live with a group of like-minded folks today. Well, my friends, if not, they're not my friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, I don't want to waste my time on these other people who haven't seen the light yet. <laughs> and uh, I don't spend my time with all people who've had Kundalini experience because that would leave out far too many people that I love and admire and want to be friends. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Mulder is wonderful. I have found some of the most wonderful people here, just as people uh, that uh, you could imagine. But they aren't in necessarily in the, but they have tolerance for me and my experience. And that's the point. Thank you so much. Thank this you. This has Mary. been a great conversation, Dorothy. Um, I'm so appreciative that you took the time to um, join us this evening, share your life story. Uh, I certain there are people who have picked up valuable insights from what you had to say. Um, I'm seeing thank you notes from, uh, from people who are participating, showing up in our chat. Uh, and, and be sure and, and, and mention, I think we already have, but I, if I may, I'll mention again, that I'm happy to talk on the phone or email, whatever, with people who are going through spiritual emergence. And many of them still think they're crazy because it's so different and so contrary to their normal way of being. So uh, they can call me if they want to. I don't charge anything. What I say is this, didn't, this gift did not cost me a penny. I didn't pay anything for it. Well, we could either... Uh... I mean, I'm reluctant to just give out your phone number to everybody, but if you if you want, we could do that. Another alternative is people can go to our Consciousness Cafe website and uh, send us a note, and we'd be happy to pass along contact information. Okay. It, uh, that would be a good way to do it, I think. Okay. Yeah. Um, and if you happen to be a member of the Consciousness Cafe meetup group, you could you could go through there as well. Yeah. Um, I'd like to take a moment to uh, comment about next week's, next Friday, we have another uh, evening uh, speaker. Um, let's see, it's uh, Michelle Bunting. Michelle uh, has done some channeling. Her most, probably the better known channeling is uh, involves Seth. 
and I'm, I'm hoping that some people recognize the name Seth. I've read uh, two or three of the Seth books. Um, some interesting insights that uh, can be obtained uh, if you believe that this is truly coming from another dimension. There are observations that uh, can be made about the human experience um, that can be shared through this channeling. So I look forward to next Friday. I hope uh, people will join us. It should be an interesting evening. I've heard Michelle in the past. Uh, Daniel is uh, one of our facilitators this evening. He's had extensive experience with, uh, uh, with Michelle and channeling in general. So I'm sure we'll be asking him to step forward and, and participate in that conversation with Michelle next week. Hey, Jim, we also have an event coming up on Sunday, a uh, last minute right. schedule. Yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about that, Danny? This Sunday at 1 to 2.30 Eastern Time, I will be interviewing and conversing with Mark Brooks, who's a member of the Consciousness Cafe team here. And we'll be uh, holding a special spring equinox uh conversation about spiritual growth and transformation. That's uh, on the Consciousness Cafe uh, website. If you want to check it out and see the details, consciousness-cafe.com. Yeah, make sure you put that dash in there or you'll go to some other Consciousness Cafe website. Thank you. All right. Um, I'm going to, a couple of technical things. Uh, I wasn't aware until this evening that I could elevate people to actually talk in this webinar setup. So I like the idea that of giving people a chance to, instead of having to have somebody else pose their questions, you know, get a chance to pose them themselves. And as long as we don't have hundreds of people trying to do it at the same time, I think I'm gonna experiment a little bit with allowing people to uh, talk like we did tonight. Uh, we have recorded this evening. Um, if you have some friends that uh, you think might be interested in this, uh, we do have a YouTube channel and it will be posted there. Um, I suggest passing this along to others. I wanna thank everybody for attending tonight. I'm, we're gonna let this run for a little bit, I think, aren't we, Daniel, instead of ending it. So if you, if you want to uh, communicate with one another, we'll leave it up for a little while and uh, uh, Jim, thank you for being a part of this. Yeah, and Jim, just one thing I'd like to share with everyone. We'll be sending out an email later with a link to this uh, recorded presentation. Well, I, I would like to thank everyone, everybody here, you, Leslie, and Daniel, and everybody who participated. This meant a great deal to me and I appreciate it very much. Well, as you said, we're, there's an awakening going on. Oh, yeah. And we're, we're all, everybody here is part of that. We're, we're, that right? we're an long, important component. How long have you been doing this? Um, Mark Brooks, who's not with us this evening, started a meetup group. Or I didn't start it. He took it over maybe, I'm going to guess, four or five years ago mm -hmm. in Charlotte. And I, I rode on his coattails and set up one in 2017, I think it was, at Greensboro. And when the virus came along, we, we realized we, that we can't get together physically. Mm -hmm. Let's try doing something over Zoom. And as long as we're expanding the, the contact with people, let's create a website to support this. So it's it's something that continues to evolve we're trying to uh we're trying to facilitate people's journeys um, providing information providing people like yourself um encouraging people to ask questions and and it, for me it's been i would guess for most people here getting on that path of of understanding who you really are you know it's it's not we, we're not just humans having a one lifetime and that's it. Uh, we're so much more than that. And when we get together with like-minded people, we get a chance to share our insights with one another and grow together. So. Wonderful. Okay, well, um, 
I guess, Dorothy, you can, we, anybody who wants to leave at this point, you're welcome. Um, the, uh, but please stay if you want to chat a little bit. Um, you know, you can send little text messages to one another. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you.